today we are moving into the age of tragedy in Howard Goodall's The Story of Music. She looks like she's about to die. What is going on in Europe? I was afraid it was like an amputated leg or something for a second. Hello everybody. Beethoven says hey. By the way, this is a Beethoven wig. He's not trying to look like me. So last time we finished up episode three of the story of music and that was on the romantic period and we covered composers like Handel, Beethoven, Chopin, Schubert, those guys. I had some questions after we got done with that and we had some pretty good discussion going on down in the comments. So I kind of want to go back to those and revisit that for a minute here before we get into the video that we're watching today. Now if you just want to go straight there to the reaction on the video today then you can click on the reaction chapter and go straight there. But just Generally, I like to kind of have a little bit of a lead into whatever we are watching, especially if it's in like a series of videos. For me, it's important to really actually learn a lot of this stuff. It's not just me doing a reaction. So one of my takeaways from the last video was when Howard Goodall got to Schubert, he pretty much just gave examples of his love songs. And I was kind of like, is this all that Schubert did was just love songs? I thought he wrote symphonies too. And a few of you did comment on that, but John Ashtone said that Schubert wrote lots of stuff actually, and he wrote nine symphonies. Although I think somebody else in the comments said that he completed seven of 13 symphonies. So I'm not really sure what number is correct. And he finished off his comment by saying that Schubert was kind of a womanizer and died of syphilis, so... They also showed some footage of the Hebrides, Hebrides, when they were discussing Mendelssohn's music, and I was like, wow, what is that? Is that in England? Well, Mark Doney McCloyd let me know that the Hebrides are off the northwest coast of Scotland, including Skye, Harris, Lewis, etc. So sorry to everybody in Scotland. I did look it up though, and uh, found a nice little map of the Hebrides, Heb Hebrides, Heb... Hmm. And then I was like, I didn't know that Scotland had all of these little islands off the top of it here. So yeah, just kind of looking at this map of Scotland, it looks like it's a really, really interesting place geographically, you know, and culturally too. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of mountains and islands and stuff. So are the Hebrides like the cliffs themselves? Is that what they are? Or because, you know, the name of it's like right in the middle of the ocean. One of the featured pieces in the last video was Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which is part of, I think it's the last movement of the Ninth Symphony. And and I mentioned that I know it more as like a Christmas song, but Fluffy Bunny, I like that name, says, I've not been aware that Ode to Joy is associated with Christmas. The only Christmas connection that springs to mind is its use in Die Hard, which is set at Christmas. So I do know that Die Hard is considered a Christmas movie by a lot of fans. So maybe that's why Ode to Joy was in it. Maybe it's like an American cultural thing that doesn't really exist elsewhere in the world. I don't know. I was kind of confused by this. So I did a little bit of digging and research and you know, my mind was kind of blown by what I found out. See, I know this tune as the hymn Joyful Joyful We Adore Thee, which we sang in church a lot, mostly at Christmas time. It's like considered a Christmas carol kind of over here in the US. And I actually found my hymnal that I grew up with. Joyful Joyful We Adore Thee is actually hymn number one. But growing up, I had absolutely no idea that it was Beethoven's tune that we were singing. So I kind of tried to figure out why this is associated with Christmas, at least over here, and I couldn't find any information about that. So maybe it's just like a weird American thing. I don't know. But what I did find out is that there are a few poems that have been kind of set to Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And so that's where this hymn comes from. The hymn was written in 1907 by Henry Van Dyke, who was a professor of English literature at Princeton University, and he was inspired by the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts. Notice I said Berkshire and not Berkshire. I have learned my lesson from my English Counties video. But basically all of his lyrics were inspired by this, which, you know, after looking at it, I can understand why. But then a lot of you also said that it is the anthem of the European Union, and I was kind of like, I didn't even know the European Union had an anthem. But the European Union anthem has a different set of lyrics set to it. It, written by Friedrich Schiller in 1785. I didn't know any of this, but I was also a little baffled because you guys were telling me that I was pronouncing Mozart wrong because I was saying Mozart, you know, and pronouncing the Z in it. The German pronunciation apparently is more of a TS. So I had some of you try to give me some helpful hints on how to pronounce it correctly. Anthrostone55 says I've always pronounced it as 
Moat's art, which I thought, yeah, that's actually really, really brilliant. Moat's art it works. And Barry Hull told me to pronounce pizza in Mozart, and I realized, yeah, we don't pronounce the Z in pizza at all. So kind of like another mind blown moment. I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. Just say it like pizza, Mozart. And one final thing I wanted to address, I didn't really know what age Beethoven was when he died. I figured it was like maybe in his early 50s or something like that, but Max Out let me know that he died at 56, so I was pretty close. He also mentioned that I might want to watch Immortal Beloved from 1994, which is kind of like, uh, he said, a mysterious... Beethoven biopic. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, let me know if that's a pretty good movie to watch. All right, so there we have it. Those were the comments that I really wanted to address. Again, I did read through all of them and I definitely appreciate you leaving the comments on these videos because they really, really do teach me a lot of things. For instance, I would have never looked into the Ode to Joy at all. If you guys hadn't told me that it's not like a Christmas song to you over in Europe, I guess, and also that the European Union used it as their anthem, I would have had no clue about that. So anyway, we're going to get into episode four of Howard Goodall's series, The Story of Music. It is called The Age of Tragedy, and I do remember the lead into it from the last video, and definitely doesn't look quite as fun as the romantic era, but you know, I guess don't knock it until you try it, right? It looks like we're going to kind of go into more of a darker place with this. I don't know if it coincides necessarily with anything happening in Europe at this time. I'm sure we'll have some historical context as well for this. So I'm curious as to why this is called the age of tragedy and why music kind of takes more of that negative term. So let's go ahead and find out. So far in this series, we've traveled from cavemen with their bone flutes to the industrial age, where large orchestras and frenetic pianists shook the bones of their weak-kneed audiences. We followed the leisurely unfolding of musical innovations in the medieval period up to the point in the 18th and early 19th century where they're coming at us thick and fast. By 1850, music's on fire, and things have got grand, gutsy, and gory. Supernatural love, destiny, death and immortality weren't invented in our own vampire-obsessed 21st century. The whole tragic love and fate thing became an obsession like no other for composers in the second half of the 19th century. They let loose a tidal wave of emotional roller coasters that left their audiences in a state of exhausted, bewildered arousal. In fact, it's hard to find a piece of music written between 1850 and 1900 that isn't about death and or destiny. These if you were looking for a starting images. point for this death and destiny craze in music, you could do a lot worse than a piece of music written by a deluded, brilliant, emotionally unstable French composer in 1829. The composer in question was a kind of cross between Beethoven and Lord Byron. His name was Hector Berlioz, his groundbreaking piece, Symphonie Fantastique. Berlioz's inspiration for his fantastical symphony was the legend of Faust, the intellectual who sells his soul to the devil in return for both knowledge and earthly pleasure. Here was a handy metaphor for the tormented, misunderstood genius whose gifts separated him from ordinary mortals. No wonder so many 19th century composers were attracted to the idea like moths to a flame. Yeah, so, so far, definitely prefer the Romantic era 
of music. Yeah, this is really not making me want to listen to any of this. Berlioz was definitely separated from ordinary mortals. He was a borderline psychopath. But the music that poured forth as catharsis from his troubled mind was immensely influential on all the other composers of the century. Apart from anything else, he legitimised the idea that being isolated and mad were the best qualifications for being a composer. The French and Germans delved further into this morose and misanthropic frame of mind as the 19th century wore on, as we'll see. Thank goodness, then, for Italian opera. <sighs> okay. So, like, the counterbalance to this? Now, maybe this will give me more of an appreciation for opera then because it looks like this was kind of offering an alternative to people to the madness and chaos going on over here in italy tragedy in opera wasn't caused by packs with the devil but bad behavior by humans well men In 19th century Italy, opera was a popular art form. I don't mean popular as in some people quite liked it. I mean popular as in everyone either went to or knew the songs from the latest operas. Hmm. If you lived in Turin or Milan or Naples in 1850, opera was your iTunes. I know this seems strange when you think of modern day opera with seats costing 100 quid plus and posh folk in DJs, but for all of the 1800s in Italy, Opera was the people's entertainment. The giant who bestrode Italian opera in the last half of the 19th century was Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi remained at the top of his game from his first hit in 1842, Nabucco, to his last, Falstaff, an astonishing 51 years later. Throughout his long and gloriously successful career of 28 operas, Verdi managed to convey often complex emotions and plots in an easy-to-grasp, enchanting-to-sing Italian vocal style, so that ordinary folk really could leave the theatre humming the tunes. I know that song. Don't know this one. I know this one too. People who couldn't afford a ticket soon heard the big hits. Barrel organists and other itinerant musicians would hang around were... the theatres, learn the. I didn't know these were opera tunes, though. Tunes and make a living playing them for punters in the street the next day. This was the mid-19th century equivalent of a jukebox. But even Verdi himself got caught up in death and destiny fever. To this already inflammatory mix, Verdi added sex. Take La Traviata, first performed in 1853. It's about a doomed love affair, climaxing in the tragic death from TB of the once promiscuous female protagonist, Violetta. Based on a recently published bestseller, The Lady of the Camellias, by Alexandre Dumas, it was a huge hit. Of course, stories like The Lady of the Camellias allowed Victorian audiences to have their cake and eat it, to enjoy being spectators of what they thought of as lewd behaviour, then have their hypocritical morals endorsed by seeing the naughty woman who indulged in it die a horrible death. Not before she's broken their defenceless hearts, mind, with a farewell of choking beauty. I 
I think the thing that I really just dislike about opera is just so melodramatic and I just don't like that kind of stuff. It's just really hard for me to get into. Plus I also feel like a lot of the melodies in opera are not very catchy. You know, they kind of just meander all over the place and they don't have kind of that repetitive melody that really captures your ear. But the Verdi songs that he just played, like those are very catchy, I feel like, because I remember them, I heard them a lot growing up, and obviously I was still able to like hum the tune to them. I don't know if he wrote his opera slightly differently than some of these others, so. to say this, I do appreciate the vocal abilities of opera singers, that's for sure. Also, she looks like she's about to die. La Traviata is accessible, tuneful, and melodramatic. But its aim is to force its audience to confront its own prejudices and double standards. It's no coincidence that the figure of the fallen woman stalks through so many operas, novels and paintings of the second half of the 19th century. With increased male, middle-class spending power came astonishing levels of prostitution. It does kind of suck though that there's a bit of a double standard there where it's the women that get the blame for it when the men are participating in it as well. Not a good thing for anybody to be doing basically. La Traviata confronts this male sexual hypocrisy that every woman had her price and yet should be condemned for it, except in the theater. So solid was the foundation Verdi created for populist Italian opera that he was able to hand over the torch to composers like Leon Cavallo, Mascagni and especially Puccini, who carried it right into the 20th century. If it had been left to the Italians, classical music would have made it to the modern age without so much as a scratch. Still completely mainstream, still loved by everyone. But some combustible Berlioz fans north of the Alps took over the helm of the ship while Verdi wasn't looking, and all hell broke loose. And I mean, hell. Oh, let's. Let's. going on in Europe? Like, what is the context for this? Because he's not really saying, like, why is everybody obsessed with, like, hell and Satan and the devil and horrible things? This is post-French Revolution and Napoleon at this point, right? I don't know. If you guys can answer this for me, let me know what the heck was going on in Europe at this point. Also, what are these paintings? Like, I mean, the content. Like, it's just, it's just death and skeletons and why? <sighs> These images they found to uh, put on this is... Outside Italy, music in the second half of the 19th century was totally dominated by a French-speaking Hungarian born in what is now Austria. I'm talking about Franz Liszt. Yes, Liszt. His music may not be as well known these days as Brahms, Tchaikovsky or Wagner, but he was the guy all other composers, including those three, looked up to. He was the trailblazer, the experimenter, the pace setter. Looks like he has kind of like a John Lennon vibe going on, actually. To do 
prove full justice to the death and destiny obsession, music needed to be turbocharged, and Liszt was the man who provided the rocket fuel. Disturbing emotions were conjured up in his harmonies. Flashy set pieces thrilled that? at disturbing... What is this thing on the bench behind him? I was afraid it was like an amputated leg or something for a second. That's not what it is, but I don't know what it is. Disturbing emotions were conjured up in his harmonies. Flashy set pieces thrilled and terrified a sensation-seeking public. Liszt was the composer who, more than anyone else in the 19th century, recalibrated music's forces. So it's worth looking in detail at some of the many innovations he brought to fruition. I feel like I've seen this painting before. This, this, uh, the statue in the window. I think I heard that that was like Beethoven in the window or something, but that doesn't really look like Beethoven to me, so that might not be right. It's weird, like that part of it almost looks like it's photoshopped. Like somebody just stuck a bust of somebody in the window in Photoshop. More than anyone else in the 19th century recalibrated music's forces. So it's worth looking in detail at some of the many innovations he brought to fruition. List innovation number one, the devil has all the best tunes. List's totem dance, death dance, triggered a craze for extravagantly ghoulish Halloween style music full of dark, deep, crashing chords and abrasive strings. What are these? It's a craze that has yet to abate. The legacy of this kind of up-tempo theatre of the macabre didn't just inspire composers of the period, like Saint-Saëns with his dance macabre, Grieg's March of the Trolls. But also film composers of our own time, like the spookily brilliant Danny Elfman. In Batman, directed by Tim Burton, edge of the seat action sequences are given an undercurrent of avenging menace by Elfman's Listian score. Huh. But Liszt's creepy death dance wasn't the only musical trick up his sleeve. Liszt innovation number two, all the fun of the fair. Liszt was a spectacular pianist who more or less single-handedly, or should that be two-handedly, forced piano builders to adopt iron frames to replace wood frames because they simply broke under the hammering he gave them on stage. Really? Interesting. dazzled audiences with his use of the piano as a kind of fairground of effects. This is Liszt in lighter, crowd-pleasing mode. His grand gallop provided the template for Offenbach's hallmark can-cans of 20 years later. Liszt became music's first international star. Some female fans became hysterical at the mere sight of him on the stage. But showy turns were only a fraction of what Liszt could do at the piano. Liszt innovation number three, first impressions. He created a style that shimmered and gleamed, an oral equivalent of the blurred vibrancy of a painting by Monet. 
where sounds like colours melted and smudged into each other. This sparkling piece was written just three years after the first Impressionist exhibition had taken place in Paris in 1874. Trying to listen to all of this and see if I've heard it before, and I haven't. I haven't heard any of this stuff by List before. I don't know, maybe that's because he's not as well known, I guess? But it's interesting that he is the inspiration for stuff I have heard before, so... Wow, what is this place? Definitely looks like it's in Europe somewhere. Although, wait a second, there's like a palm tree up there, so maybe not. Maybe it's a palm tree. It kind of looks like one. If you guys know what this building is, let me know. I've never seen anything like that before with a waterfall like that. I guess there would be palm trees in Europe. Like maybe in Spain, you guys would have like around the Mediterranean and stuff. You might have palm trees. List's incandescent paintings in sound were to be hugely influential on a younger generation of French composers, particularly Claude Debussy. Debussy's glimmering piano pictures owe a huge debt to Liszt, whom he revered like a disciple. I do know some Debussy pieces. This is not one of them, though. Liszt's contribution to orchestral music was equally immense. Liszt innovation number four, symphonic poems. He invented what he called the symphonic poem and wrote 13 of them to get the new form off to a cracking start. This is Liszt's symphonic poem Prometheus, inspired by the Greek myth in which the titan Prometheus steals fire from Zeus to give to mankind. He's punished by being bound to a rock while a great eagle snacks on his liver every dawn for eternity. Okay. Well, that's Pain great. and anguish saturate the music. The idea behind Liszt's symphonic poems was to reduce the traditional four-movement symphony, as perfected by Beethoven, into one concentrated shorter piece that would be a musical response to a non-musical artwork. By doing this, Liszt was moving away from the idea of music as an abstract entity of its own, where audiences listened attentively to 40 minutes of pure music, like doing a crossword or a brain teaser. His symphonic poems took just one scene, a character, or a snapshot, and wove the music around that. Okay, stop showing the liver picture. It was Liszt, more than anyone, who shifted the emphasis away from orchestral music as pure music to music that tried to illustrate something else. This, for example, is the opening of his symphonic poem, Hunnenschlacht, the one inspired by a then famous mural of one of Attila the Hun's many battles. Fought in 451 AD against the now Christian Roman Empire and their allies, this was a rare example in which Attila and his heathen Huns got a sound thrashing. Liszt's musical response to the painting attempts to depict the ghostly armies of the battle mustering for the fight. 
Interspersed amongst the whispery strings are military outbursts from the horns. You'll notice in the painting that there are relatively few actual soldiers depicted. It's more ordinary men and women who've been engulfed unwittingly in the conflict. So Liszt is careful not to make his orchestra sound too percussive and martial, at least to start off with. Eventually, the battle proper kicks off, and if you look closely, you'll see the Romans carrying a gleaming golden cross. In the midst of the battle's tumult and chaos, Liszt introduces on the trombones an old plain song chant, Crux Fidelis, Faithful Cross, to represent this image in the scene. The final three minutes or so of the piece has the plain song theme interwoven into increasingly excited strings. Liszt rounds off his musical account of the painting with storming victory music, complete with extra brass reinforcements and a pipe organ. With the instruction, if it can't be louder than the whole orchestra, don't bother. This was music on a grander, supercharged scale than had ever been heard before. And when younger composers like Wagner and Tchaikovsky heard it, it thrilled and inspired them. For an audience in a concert hall, it was equally awesome. Liszt was setting a standard for everyone else to meet. If the atmosphere of the final climax sounds familiar to you, here's why. It's exactly the sort of grandiose and hyperventilated music you'll have heard over the years in countless movies. It's been a very long time since I have seen The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston in it. Boy, those special effects, I guess for the 19... 1956, was pretty good. Yeah, I was thinking that this style of music sounds pretty familiar, but I can't really place why, and when he says, yeah, it's like a film score, then it makes perfect sense. Yes, it definitely sounds like film scores, particularly more classic film scores, like from the 40s, 50s, and so forth. <laughs> In Cecil B. DeMille's epic The Ten Commandments, made in 1956, Moses Call parting the Red geese. Sea wouldn't be half as thrilling without <laughs> Elmer Bernstein's stirring score. Okay. Liszt's symphonic poems, where the music conjures up the drama of a scene, is where the technique of how one might score a film began. I have to say, that looks like chaos to film, with all of those animals and stuff, especially. And Liszt was also ahead of the curve on another 20th century development. Liszt innovation number five, serial thriller. <laughs> In his Faust Symphony of 1857, Liszt includes a melodic phrase that, while it might not sound all that revolutionary to our ears now, was to light a long fuse and prefigure a complete dismantlement of the basic building blocks of Western music. The opening theme of 12 notes may not be an instantly hummable melody. But it does, as it happens, use up all 12 notes of the Western scale without repeating any of them. So what, you may say? Well, this is what. When the Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg, 68 years later, proposed a new way of organising music, whereby a melody could only use the 12 notes of the Western scale without repeating any of them, a method known as 12-tone serialism, it more or less brought about the collapse of musical civilization as we know it. What no kidding. Heck? But Liszt had been experimenting with it in this symphony over half a century earlier with no fuss or bother. Liszt had died by the time the only 12 notes never repeated idea really took hold. 
He might also have been appalled by the uses to which yet another of his list of innovations was eventually put, what used to be called musical nationalism, or one might say the ethnic heritage phenomenon. List innovation number six, I can't get no self-determination. I have heard this. In 1848, there were a series of revolutions all over Europe. Many of them were set in train by groups of people who shared a common language and culture, who wanted to gain independence from the various superpowers that controlled them. This music right here, I associate with Mexico. I feel like I've heard it in like westerns, especially when it's like the cowboys facing a Mexican something. But I associate it with Spanish music. Most of all, the Austrian Empire ruled from Vienna. Although the Austrians don't have anything to do with Spanish. <laughs> One of the 1848 uprisings took place in List's native Hungary. The rebels were crushed. List composed a set of what he called Hungarian Rhapsodies. They were certainly rhapsodic, but how genuinely Hungarian were they? List, like every other composer of his time... Why am I saying this is Spanish? Because obviously it's like Austrian-Hungarian that they're saying here. So why do I associate it with, like, Mexico? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm not remembering that right. I do associate it with something in film or television. I feel like a Western over here in the U.S. Though maybe they did use it for that purpose. I don't know. But yes, it does sound more Hungarian there. Hmm. His time was a trifle confused about what indigenous Hungarian music actually was, believing it to be the same as gypsy music, which in turn was often muddled up with Turkish music. We now know they were all wrong, that gypsy music was separate and different from Hungarian folk music, and that the music they all thought was gypsy music was in fact Hungarian folk music played by gypsies in Budapest and other cities for the enjoyment of better off Hungarian and Austrian patrons. What? The gypsies kept their own music to themselves. Did you guys get that? Because I don't think I did. It's important to make one thing absolutely clear. The ethnic heritage phenomenon may have been motivated by a deep and sincere love of country and of the traditions and roots of peoples who felt bossed about by other more powerful nations. No doubt about it. But what it was not was a bottom-up grassroots movement whereby peasant troubadours presented the treasures of their communities to the world. In all cases, the movement sometimes called nationalism in music was concocted by highly trained, sophisticated, well-traveled, middle-class composers who took bits and pieces of folk song and dance that they'd heard and tarted them up. The music that emerged was aimed at a mainstream audience oh, really? who had no real interest in peasant culture whatsoever. So I'm going to leave it there before we get into Brahms, who, by the way, I didn't know he wrote the Hungarian dance number five. I have heard that a lot, of course, throughout my life, but it's one of those where you hear the music, but you don't know who wrote it. Okay, so, so far, I have to say that the Romantic era for me definitely trumps this era. What is this era called? Because I know that there's like a classical era as well. Is that what this is? Or did that come before the Romantic era? I can't remember. Now Brahms I like. I can get behind him. I do like some of Debussy's music. It seems like the age of 
tragedy is starting to take a bit of a turn more to things other than like death and tragedy. But I may have spoken too soon, we may get back into that in part two, but definitely do prefer the music of Mozart and Beethoven to this stuff from what I've heard so far. I'd be interested to hear from you what you think of this era of music and also just please let me know what the context for all of this is. Like why is there such like this a dark emphasis on music during this time? I don't know why he hasn't gone into that, like what the reason for that is. Seems like he's been pretty good providing some context for all of this stuff in previous episodes but this one he's just kind of not even bothering with that so it's really bugging me. But anyway I guess we'll leave it there. We'll pick up with Brahms in part two next week. But if you enjoyed this video make sure that you like and subscribe. Sundays is our day for music. But Beethoven here and I appreciate you watching and we hope that you'll join us for part two next time.